Hey everybody, in this episode we're going to be talking about going home after a long time away and finding out that you're not the only one that's grown up. And also, what to do when Dr. Frankenstein creates his monster. That's right, we're talking about episode 20 of season 2. This is Horizon, an episode that originally aired on April 16th, 2003. Welcome to Trek in Time where we're watching every episode of Star Trek in chronological order, and we're taking a look at when it dropped in our history. Right now, we're still early days looking at Enterprise in the second season, which means we're also looking at 2003. And who are we? Well, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. And with me is my brother, Matt. Matthew is the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? Well, as regular <laughs> listeners and viewers might know, we did not drop an episode last week. That was not by design. That was because of COVID. I, last Friday, woke up feeling like I wasn't quite right and I wasn't wrong. Mid-morning, I took a COVID test, discovered I had contracted it, and I've spent the past week recovering. And in an example of the science can work vaccines and boosters helped me get through the illness without it being much more than a flu and the same goes for my partner she also contracted it and has come through it as well we're still testing positive we're still taking precautions we're still keeping ourselves out of the public but we are both clearly on the mend and so we're feeling better and there were some people in the community who reached out to me when they found out that I had COVID and they said they hoped I recovered quickly. I appreciate all the support. Thank you so much to everybody. So today's episode, we're talking about Horizon. This is an episode from April 16th, 2003. Matt, big picture. What'd you think? Uh, I'm going to feel like a broken record because once again, I'm kind of like, meh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that this overall was, I'm in the same vein. I felt like maybe it was a little too little too late and yeah, there are our broken record for this series at this point seems to be everybody involved in the show knows what they're doing, but they're just not doing quite enough of it. So I'm looking, I'm looking forward to the next season because that's where things take a nice turn. Before we get into the nitty gritty, Matt, do you have any episodes, any comments from previous episodes that you wanted to share with us? I do. From the episode Judgment, which was the Klingon trial episode, uh, Pale Ghost 69 wrote, I was so distracted by the gavel gauntlet that I almost mm. missed the episode. Is the ball flint or the is 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 the ball flint or the sounding block? How heavy is it? Has the judge ever lit his clothes on fire? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I found the episode kind of meh. And after hearing you guys talk about the fan service, it makes me wonder if this was a script from another show that got made mad libbed with Star Trek terminology. Mm. Seems like something more out of Andromeda or Farscape, but with a single uh, coat of Klingon paint. Uh, He went on and ended it with also the thumbnail for our episode could have been to kill a mockingbird of prey Uh. (laughs) (laughs) since it would have fit the gratuitous amount of fan service in this episode. Mm. I like that a lot. Yeah. The other comment was from Mako. And he said, love the idea that Kolos is Socrates, accepting the laws even when they don't make a lot of sense, and that whole moral debate. Uh, This writer also wrote on the Orville, along with Braga and some other tech Trek writers. There were several episodes there that have a similar perspective. Uh, Love the video. Keep them coming. So thank you, Mako, for that. I wanted to to read this because I wanted to kind of mention the Orville. Sadly, the Orville is a better Star Trek show (laughs) than this season of an official Star Trek show. Uh, If you haven't watched the Orville, I strongly recommend watching it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's a series that I haven't checked out yet, but everybody who I know who's into Star Trek says it's worth the time. Yes. And it has that Galaxy Quest feel as well, how Galaxy Quest in a lot of people's hearts, including my own, is a Star Trek movie, even though it's not a Star Trek movie. It's exactly it hits those notes. Yep. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear myself over that. What is that? Oh, it's. It's a read alert. That can only mean one thing. Matt, <laughs> get ready. And I mean that seriously. Get ready. Because this is a long one. <laughs> this is the synopsis for this episode from Wikipedia. And here oh, we go, dear. Matt. Good luck. Oh, dear God. Horizon is the 20th episode. 
<laughs> this okay. is so long. You want me to read this whole thing? Yes. This whole thing is the synopsis. This Whoa. is the synopsis. Horizon is the 20th episode of the second season of the science fiction television series Star Trek Enterprise and originally aired on April 16th, 2003 on UPN. The episode was written by Andre uh, Bormanis and directed by James A. Conter. The episode's guest stars uh, include Nicole Forrester, who had previously appeared in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Joan Pringle, and Corey Mendel Parker. All right. Yep. Set in the 22nd... <laughs> God. Set in the 22nd century, the series follows the adventures of the first Starfleet Starship Enterprise, registration NX-01. When the ship detours to observe volcanic activity on a planet, Ensign Mayweather, Anthony Montgomery, takes the opportunity to visit his family on board the ECS Horizon. Montgomery had previously just suggested the appearance, the appearance of Mayweather's parents at the end of season one and was pleased to see them introduced. <laughs> okay. Several sets to create the horizon were created on a soundstage with the related scenes filmed in the second half of the episode's shoot after the main cast were dismissed. With the exception of Montgomery, critical response was mixed and the episode received the lowest ratings for the first run episode for a first run episode of the series so far viewed by 3.36 million viewers. Holy crap, Sean. Wow. Yes. <laughs> that is quite a synopsis. That's insane. To any of our viewers or listeners who haven't experienced it, I think that the best way to encapsulate how a synopsis like this can come into being, I would recommend going to YouTube and searching for the video, Too Many Cooks. Yes. Too Many Cooks. It's, there's a point where the Wikipedia allowance of anybody being able to go in and revise starts to, well, yeah. Let's just say it can create more of a mess than it needs to. So as was said, this is from season two, episode 20. James Contner was the director. Andre Barmanis was the writer. And it originally dropped on April 16th, 2003. And I think we'll all remember some of the world that this episode dropped in. For example, Matt, I know you were still into club with 50 Cent. Mm, yes. That's right. That was the number one song in the country at the time. And in theaters, we were just finding out about anger management, which earned $42 million. People may remember that anger management is a 2003 American buddy comedy directed by Peter Segal and written by David Dorfman. It stars Adam Sandler, Jack Nicholson, Marissa Tomei, Luis Guzman, Woody Harrelson, and John Turturro. I have the no film memory of this movie. <laughs> The it's, it's, it's interesting. This is the first movie for me in a while where I have not only clear recollection of having seen the movie, but having very mixed response to it. It mm -hmm. is a movie that as time has gone by, I appreciate it more mm -hmm. than when I originally saw it. I did not like it when I saw it originally, but it's one of those movies that I think it was doing some things in a way that was a little more subtle than the filmmakers actually allowed it to be. Like, I think under a slightly different director, it could have hit on some better notes. The movie would go on to make $195 million, And if anybody's curious about it, it's on HBO Max right now. And on television, what were we watching on April 16th, 2003? Well, only about 3.6 million, 3.4 million people were watching Enterprise. Everybody else was tuning in to My Wife and Kids, George Lopez, Star Search, again, that program that is from another parallel it's universe. A, yeah. <laughs> I have a feeling that in the next Marvel movie, Dr. Strange and the multiverse of madness, there's going to be a multiverse scene where you're going to see Dr. Strange watching star search in the prime time on CBS or he's on it. And there's that 70s show American idol dateline and Dawson's Creek Dawson's Creek being the only show that enterprise was beating as far as its viewership. But from a share perspective, meaning a share of televisions that the program was actually viewed on, it actually beat Star Trek. So there were more television sets tuned in to Dawson's Creek than Enterprise. But there were more people watching Enterprise than Dawson's Creek. So you figure that out. And for the week, top show was American Idol with 19 million people, almost 20. And no surprises there, considering the juggernaut that that show continues to be to this day. And in the news from the New York Times, April 16th, 2003, headlines included, we were now in April, 
and we'll remember that March was when the U.S. invaded Iraq. But at this point, the Pentagon was already claiming that fighting was done. U.S. troops and Iraqi patrols were patrolling together, and the U.S. was talking about how rebuilding of the Iraqi government would begin. And spoiler, we know how that's turned out since then. So this episode is the first episode in a while to have an actual date. This is January 2153. So happy new year, Enterprise crew. And as we find out at the beginning of the episode, the Enterprise is tootling away in space and they are ordered to turn around and go back to examine the potential destruction of a planet that they had passed, which is now going between two gas giants in its own system. And the Enterprise is ordered to go back because of scientific endeavors. Given the opportunity to do so, well, we finally get something that it turns out the actor Montgomery also wanted. Mm -hmm. We get an opportunity to double back and the Enterprise will be passing close enough to Mayweather's home ship, the Horizon, And Mayweather asks for a leave so that he can visit his family aboard the Horizon for the very touching reason of his father being ill. And sadly, we find out very quickly, his father has actually passed away six weeks earlier. So it is now turned into a bittersweet visit by Mayweather to his home. The setup of this episode, you and I have talked previously about how (laughs) Mayweather is an underutilized character. He's yes. never given time. Interesting things about his backstory are presented in the first season that are never explored. And you and I complained about it from the perspective of, and they never did anything with it. And here it is. And then we sit down for this week's episode. I start watching it and I thought, ye gods, they did do something with it. Why <laughs> don't I remember? And then by the end of the episode. Yep. I remembered why I didn't remember. Yep. The setup of this episode, the promise of this episode is very hard for Enterprise at this point, which is now laboring. You had seven years of Voyager. You had seven years of Deep Space Nine. And you had seven years of Next Generation. You had 21 years of programming under the older model of how many episodes per season were made numbers now are very different so now we have you know new series that are coming out on paramount plus with the new strange new worlds or discovery shorter series runs different ways of writing episodes Uh, the the construction of a season looks very different than it used to so you can't really apples to apples with a new program versus these older programs but enterprise was of that era So following on the heels of 21 years worth of program, it is very hard for the smallest kid in the family to live up to the big brothers and big sisters in the family. And this episode, right out of the gate, I'm thinking they've constructed an episode which is going to revolve around the same themes as the show Family from Next Generation, which is I think one of the best pieces of writing in the entirety of next generation Mm -hmm. and what they end up doing with Mayweather and his family and the dilemmas that they put them in. Yep. Amounts to so little. Yep. As to not matter. It has no bearing on anything going on on the ship other than the potential there is a tease at a moment of perhaps Mayweather won't go back to the Enterprise right now. But even that feels like a splash of a pebble in a bucket as opposed to well, in the episode Family where the potential for Picard to not return to the Enterprise is a, a gigantic tidal wave for the series. Well, the, the character development in Family, Picard goes through a catharsis in that episode because he's never grappled with what happened to him with the Borg. And so it's that episode is all about the main character from the show that we know and we love and we're tied to. We're watching him grapple with something horrible that we went, he went through in previous episodes. It pertains to the main series. It pertains to the character we care about. The character development in this episode is all Mayweather's family. It's really not Mayweather. It's his mother coming to grips with things. 
It's his brother learning to be a commander and to accept that his brother left. It's like all the people that have the evolution of character are characters we've just met and don't give two craps about. And the guy that we are supposed to care about, we barely know. So it's like there's no, yeah. there was never, there was never build up for the, and there was no payoff. So it completely fell. And that's, I'm, I'm right with you of, I completely forgot about this episode. It's yeah. a, it's a nothing burger. It's a meh episode. The acting is fine. The dialogue is fine. The yeah. action sequences are fine, but there's nothing to take away from it. And that raises one thing I wanted to kind of bring up, which is here's a show that is set at the beginning of the Federation, at the beginning of Starfleet. They're trying to brag. <laughs> Braga is basically whenever they write episodes and they, they figure out what the storyline is that they're doing, they're basically just replicating what has been done on every other show yeah. in the Star Trek lore. They're at a time period where there is a lot of change happening for humanity. And change is hard and change means not everybody's going to be on board and the fact that there's potential conflicts within humanity as to what what it means to be explorers and go out to space when we have problems over here and here and here yeah why were they not exploring that conflict within humanity instead all they're they're doing is humanity is one unified whole even at this point in the show and all the enemies are from without the conflict with the vulcans the conflict with the andorians the conflict with the the Klingons, that's Star Trek we already know. It would have been far more interesting to see humanity not completely cohesive yet, not yeah. in complete agreement. And you have factions of these shipping lanes of people that are making a living, just like the truckers of the uh, galaxy doing their work, and they don't like what's changing because Starfleet's taken over. And they literally just gonna... had a trucker revolt in Canada. Correct. Yes. Uh, like, like we literally just had that and that yes. kind of thing within this Star Trek, Star Trek lore would have been, it's never been done. It's never been done. It would have been an interesting perspective. It would have been new, interesting, unique. And we've talked about how like, uh, like Braga and all the other producers and writers of the show that have been doing it for decades seem tired. They seem yeah. to be out of ideas. They seem to be kind of like going into the well of old ideas. Why didn't they do this? Cause I'm sure it would have been more interesting for their creativity and their enjoyment yeah. to go down this path and they didn't it's so frustrating i think that I, I agree with everything you just said and and i you know for better or worse series that you and i have we put on our rewriter hats and you know jump into revising the the script uh, i'm going to do that right now everything in this show should have been inverted meaning mayweather goes home he goes home finds out his father's already passed away mayweather on the enterprise has already demonstrated a certain unwillingness to challenge authority, an unwillingness to step across a line and challenge authority. He's reliant on authority above him, knowing what's going on. Lean into that. He goes home and he is reluctant to push against a power structure that he feels is formed in the, the years that he hasn't been there. He's reluctant to push back against his brother. He's reluctant to push back against his mom. Instead of what you have in the series, which does not, in this episode, which does not make any sense, his brother is arguing with him against any change to the status quo. I think it would have been far more interesting for his brother to be pumping him for information of, can you help us squeak a little bit more out of these engines? Can you do something to give us better shielding and better weapons? Can you do these things? What, can, what have you learned in Starfleet that could help us? Mm -hmm. And for Mayweather to be reluctant in sharing any of that information. Well, I'm not really an engineer. I don't really know all those things. I don't want to do something that could endanger the ship. Come on. You know that we jerry rig these things. You know that we push this ship to the edge. We have to keep pushing. Otherwise, we're going to drown. We're losing to newer ships. We're losing to the changing technology around us. We need to do these things to keep up. And Mayweather pulling back and being reluctant to do things right up until they get attacked. Then they get mm -hmm. attacked and Mayweather is now in a position where everybody turns and says, you are the only one here who has done things against this species. You know what's happening here. What can you do to help us and have him reluctantly step into a role that he's not ready for? And he should be reluctantly stepping into a role that he's not, he doesn't think he's ready for because he's still operating under the ghost of his father. Right. Then he has to be challenged by his mother, by his brother. Like, look, dad loved you and dad is gone 
But dad, if he was here, would be telling you, son, step up. You have the tools to be able to get us out of this problem. Force him to sort of exercise the ghost of his father and his past in order to help his family get up and out of this problem, Mm -hmm. as opposed to it being him showing up and right out of the bat, I'm like, he's really being a jerk. Yeah. To his brother. Yes. He's doing things outside the chain of command, and that doesn't fit within his character. He is not no. that character. He would not step outside the chains of command, even in a circumstance like this, because as he tells Archer time and time again, when you're in a cargo sen- vessel scenario, you're like a family, you're an extended family, and all of those relationships have to be firm. Otherwise, chaos is going to reign. So when he goes back and starts doing stuff behind his brother's back, it didn't make any sense to me. He's causing chaos. He's destabilizing the environment. He's really, it's written as if we are on Mayweather's side, but what he is actually doing, and there's no comeuppance here. There's no, nobody challenges him on this. And for me, that was a weakness in the writing that he is destabilizing his brother's command. Mm Mm-hmm. And nobody points out to him like, look, you can't be telling your brother that he's ready to be a commander, but at the same time, you're doing this other Undermine stuff. him. Yep. You can't be doing that. So the writing is weak in that regard. And then it's weaker still, I think, in how it sets up. Like I said, if the entire thing was inverted so that Mayweather was the one being pulled out of his comfort zone by his family saying, look, you know how we have to operate. You know that we we you know we take a, a thing of duct tape out and we repair, you know the 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 damage to the exterior of the ship is with spit and and some polish and then we get to the nearest star base and we repair there when we can, but you've got to help us get there because we're not yeah. going to make it, and for him to reluctantly be pulled into that fight where he's like I know I have the tools, but I'm reluctant to use them. Mm-hmm. And for him to then go back to the Enterprise and have that same moment with the captain who I like the dynamic that they show between Archer and Mayweather when he comes back and the captain well, greets him at the door and is really kind of like, welcome home. That would have been an interesting moment for there to be some subtlety to the conversation along the lines of Mayweather at the beginning of the episode. What if there had been something that they had been talking about that Mayweather had a thought on but was unwilling to challenge his captain on it? But when he gets yeah. back, he says, oh, by the way, I, I wanted want to talk, to, talk to you about that thing that we were talking about earlier. I have some different ideas that you, I think you might enjoy. And having the captain say, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on that. Like, Show that growth of, like you said, that character that we know about, we care about. Because the one that we see grow is his brother. Yeah. The, the character the we're never going to see again. Your rewrite also would strengthen the B plot line in this episode, which is all about the crew watching frankenstein and horror movies and trying to get to paul yes to go watch the movie it would appear a little bit because it's basically travis would have been the outsider looking in on his family structure and the mm-hmm. and trying to basically find his way back in and to paul it's the same exact thing she's the outsider of the crew that yeah. has this family atmosphere of watching these movies and watching her try to inject herself and find her place in the enterprise family you'd had two things kind of paralleling each other the exact opposite's happening. Yeah. So we keep jumping back to the Enterprise and this whole Frankenstein movie thing. It's like, okay, this is fun. I mean, it's funny. It's like lighthearted, but, but it's, it's like not it tying didn't anything. tie together yeah. into a theme for the, what was the theme of the episode? It didn't make any sense. Yeah. But, but that aside, I did like the B plot line because I, th- I thought it was fun to watch to Paul's take on it. And I really yeah. enjoyed the conversation with her asking a trip basically like why do you watch horror movies and he's like it's good to get scared and she equated it to a, a vulcan practice yes where they deliberately try to basically scare the crap out of themselves to elicit an emotion that they can then try to suppress right and i was like that's awesome it's great that she's finding this connection yeah where she can have an in to watching these movies to kind of like a scientist analyze her own emotional reaction to what she's watching, right? her colleagues and how they're reacting to it. So it's, it becomes more of like a science experiment to her. Yeah. It's, it's kind of fun that they brought that out. I, I also enjoyed the B storyline, but I thought I would have enjoyed it more if it had included a little more payoff on the back end in the form of her not only being open to, oh, I could you know, go and experience these movies with the crew and have that bonding experience, 
But if she had gone on even deeper into the kinds of analysis and I can view this like a Petri dish sort of approach that was clearly unsettling to Trip and Archer, where she says, I found it to be a tremendous metaphor for humanity's experience with the alien. Mm -hmm. And the two of them wanting to push back on that of like, no, 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 we're not, we're not like villagers with torches and pits, pitchforks. And her pointing out like, no, you really kind of are. Like the first Vulcans that you yeah. experienced, you, you encountered, there was a violent and angry pushback by humanity. There was that element. Yeah. And I would have appreciated more of her, uh, something along the lines of her saying, like, I've asked for the list of the upcoming films because I was hoping maybe we could discuss the socioeconomic impacts of what Earth was like at the times that those movies were produced and like right like really looking at it like i'm gonna mine you guys for information around these things so that my experience of going in and seeing the movie is a fuller more you know like, like and having the two of them kind of like reel <laughs> yeah. back and like like no, no 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 that's not what we're talking about we don't want to experience the movie like that but having to meet her halfway like yes. having a moment of one of them say look I don't know that I want to actually have to write a treatise about these movies, but I'm happy to talk to you about them before and after right. and have it be like, yeah, that would be, that would be acceptable. Like, like her saying something along the lines of, okay, I get that you don't want to view it as a scientific experiment, but I also appreciate your willingness to open that door for me because the episode revolves around the B storyline revolves very heavily. She's not wrong it's a very human centric approach that they're making. And again, we've talked about this before. Archer is crossing a thick line with I'm ordering you to go watch this yeah. movie. It is not a comfortable thing. Like you think about like all the people in like our workplaces with all sorts of, you know, personal reasons as to why they might not be able to go into X, Y, or Z social thing around work. Mm -hmm. The idea of a boss ordering an employee to go to an event where for whatever mm -hmm. reason, there's a thousand reasons why an individual might not go to a social gathering of coworkers. It really is just not good management to no. have your captain saying like, you're going to go to this thing. I'm going to order you to go to watch this movie. So lightening up on that a little bit and opening up more of a door of her saying like, okay, you want me to do this and I'm doing it, but some of it has to be on my terms and having them being open to like, you're right. Like we can meet you halfway. We can agree. Like, look on the movie nights. Why don't we agree that we'll have a dinner before the movie and we can talk about some of this stuff before we go see it. So like really building that camaraderie there and showing how, the family that Mayweather is leaving behind is still strong, but the family that's on the enterprise is getting stronger yes. as a result of, of them having stuff like this. So it would, have, it would have made the theme of the episode much stronger to do that. Yeah. There is one nitpick that I have that's, I think, at the very end of the episode. There's, a, there's literally a scene where Travis says to his brother, I can talk to Lieutenant Reed about getting you some guy some stuff that could help you defend yourselves mm -hmm. and his brother's like yeah that sounds great and like i think it's the next scene or a couple scenes later he's coming back on the enterprise and the captain says it's great to have you home and he says any problems out there and travis goes nope nope <laughs> and they go walking this way wait you literally just told your brother you're going to talk to lieutenant reed about getting help and then your captain says to you anything 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 happen it's like no nope, no nope. it's like that made zero sense i was yeah. like what 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 just happened yeah. did they did they film that scene first and then they added a different scene that i feel like i know happened? what they were going for i feel like i know what they were trying to get to which was the cargo vessel is not only like a family but the cargo vessel vessel prides itself on being able to take care of itself but he just offered yes i understand that i understand just but offered. that's his a weakness brother took him up on that's his brother a weakness. says yes yes that is a weakness in the writing i completely agree <laughs> But in that moment, I saw what was, I saw the wheel that was spinning in the background, which was, oh, they're yes. trying to demonstrate that they know how to take care of themselves. But I also in that moment had the exact same thought you did, which was his answer in the context of what has been going on makes zero sense because what he should be doing is saying, Captain, I'd really like the opportunity to talk to you about getting both Commander Tucker and Commander Reed to talk to the commanders of the cargo vessel 
about ways that they can improve the ship because they do need some additional help because things are happening. Like right. that would have been the better response, but yes. within this whole like family can take care of itself, pull itself up by its bootstraps mentality that they're trying to but get it, to. He says it, this idiotic thing that doesn't make any sense, but it felt to me like the episode was written without the offer about Lieutenant Reed. I can talk to Lieutenant Reed and it felt like, did they ad lib that scene after the episode was yeah. written? So that's why it's so out of context with what the episode is trying to do. It, it, it made no, no sense. It was so yeah. frustrating. Yeah. So it goes, I mean, I think the end result is this episode from everything I've seen was not very well received. It wasn't a very high viewership. In fact, I believe it's the low point in the season. We Can had I just been say something? asking. Yeah. Yeah. Something to that. When we've talked about how Travis and like Hoshi are like underutilized and the episodes where they did try to make them the centerpiece have always been low performers yeah and i feel like as the producers they're looking at oh well the travis episode didn't do well we're not going to focus on him well no it was your execution of how you yeah. you know brought travis about and it feels like these characters got short shrift because they weren't executing on the characters well at all and so that just doubled down on them ignoring these characters yeah i was going to say the same thing that anthony montgomery uh he hoped for something along these lines and what he was given didn't live up to the promise of what it could have been. This was mm -hmm. that as you and I mentioned in a previous episode, when we talked about the character of Mayweather, the experience of these cargo haulers is really, that is the most direct tie in to the original pitch of star Trek by Roddenberry, which was rag wagon train to the stars wagon train to the stars is not one of the elite ships in Starfleet going out and exploring the galaxy wagon train would literally be these kinds of cargo haulers working mm -hmm. to connect an expanding human presence in a frontier. And these characters Mayweather in particular deserved better than this episode gave. And I just, I'm, I found it unfortunate as I was watching the episode and thinking, watching things like him undermining his brother. I'm like, nobody intended for that to be what he was doing. It's not being used as a plot point. It's not being used in a way that makes sense within the story. It's accidental. And it's because they, like we've talked about previously, the exhaustion just seems to be real. And an episode like this just doesn't fire on the right cylinders. Yep. So. Before we get into what's happening next time, Matt, do you have anything you want to remind our listeners about that you have coming up on your other channel? I'm um, just keep an eye out on Undecided, which actually is an operating channel now because I actually had a channel suspension last week, which was exciting. You should listen to Still to Be Determined for the details on that. But I have an episode coming up on what the largest batteries are in use today, and it might not be what you think. Hmm. As for me, you can check out my website, seanferrell.com. You can look for my books there, or you can look for my books at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your local bookstore. They're available everywhere. And next time, we're going to be talking about the episode, The Breach. Man, any expectations? What are we going to be talking about around The Breach? Um, Something that probably uh, breached something, mm. maybe. It's going to be a giant space baby being born the wrong direction. <laughs> it's Breach! <laughs> Don't forget, if you'd like to support the show, please do consider reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever it is that you like to podcast, podcast, podcast. And if you'd like to more directly support the show, you can go to trekintime.show, click the Become the Supporter button, and then you can throw some gold-pressed latinum, gold latinum coins at our heads. It doesn't feel as good as it sounds, but trust me, we enjoy it nonetheless. All of that really does help support the show. And thank you so much for listening or watching. We'll see you next time.